Um, we did finish hmm? Chamber of Secrets, right? I think we had like a chapter though. Yeah, I think we had you also said Like we did it. What I was hoping you would We not were say. almost done. Yeah, it was Dumbledore and Harry were meeting in his office. Oh, yeah. No, it wasn't in his office. It was it up in the staff room. The I thought we finished that part. We did not get to the end where something someone gives something to someone. Yeah. We did not get to that one. Yeah, we didn't get to that part. I'm trying not to say anything. No, you're fine. Because people haven't read it. I'm like, I was 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 like, Harry gets Ron, Jenny, uh, Lockhart safely out of the Chamber of Secrets, gets them up to the common room where the Weasleys are, and I'm trying to just zip through it. Um, Dumbledore says that Jenny was tricked, let me put it that way, enchanted by Lord Voldemort, because of the diary and stuff, gets them squared away, and everybody leaves, so it's, so it's just Dumbledore and Harry. Pages 332 and following. We're only going to spend maybe 10 minutes at most on this. And so he has, you know, his debriefing, as I like to call it. He tells Harry to sit down, and he says, first of all, I want to thank you. This is on 332. You must have shown me real loyalty down in the chamber. Nothing but that could have called Fox to you. Did we talk about this? Yeah, we did. Yes. We did talk about that. And I have no we idea. Well, like, where? There is no chapter after this. Well, it was, we had got to the point where Mal, Lucius Malfoy shows Okay, up. Malfoy shows up, wants to know what Dumbledore is doing there. Dumbledore kind of explains. <laughs> and... Harry mentions, you gave Ginny the book, the diary. Malfoy says, prove it. And Dumbledore says, notice Dumbledore says, not Harry, oh, nobody will, be able, will ever be able to prove it. I mean, that, you did that well. He says, but don't let any of Voldemort's dark arts stuff show up anymore. And Malfoy goes to leave. And Harry asks Dumbledore if he can have the diary. Dumbledore says yes. What does Harry do with it? According to the book, not the film. Because it's different. He says he's not on the book. On the book, isn't he? No. In the film, Harry does this. This is the sock. This is the diary. He puts the sock inside the book. Okay? And he says... Mr. Malfoy, I have something. And he hands it to him. Okay? In the book, he takes the book and puts it inside the sock. What's, how's that different? What does that require Malfoy to do if he wants to keep the diary? Does he know that the thing in the diary has been destroyed? No, he doesn't. So he kind of wants the diary back. So what must Malfoy now do? Take the sock. He's got to pull the book out of the sock, and now he's left holding, as it's described, a smelly, stinky, sweaty sock. Doesn't want to do that. And who's standing right there? Don Dobby. Dobby is there. But he could have done... If it were like in the film, where he's got the book in his hands and he's got this smelly sock, it's not directly handing like it is if he takes it out and does this. Okay? I think that's the only significance of that scene. But a little bit difference between the film and the book. In the film, what does then Malfoy attempt to do? Because Dobby says, a, a sock, master gave me a sock, Dobby's free, you know, okay? Malfoy goes all ballistic, 
almost. And what does he attempt to do in the film? Kill Harry. He doesn't do it in the book. He tries to kill Harry. Yeah, but not in the book. In the book, he's just, boy, you have lost me my house elf. And Dobby's like, thou shalt not, you know, harm Harry Potter and blast him. In the film, he's got a walking stick and he pulls out of the tip of the walking stick his wand. And he starts to go, Abba. He starts to say, Abba, again, Abba. Smart move, stupid move. Very stupid. Think of where he is. Very stupid. He's Very just stupid. outside Dumbledore's office. Okay? Yeah, it doesn't make a lot of sense. What's the really important part of, of that final chapter, though, where Dumbledore is talking with Harry? Two things, really. One, use Harry's words. He put a bit of himself into me. And Dumbledore says yes. And what's the other one? Because the other one's going to come up at the end of this book. And what it's going to show is Harry didn't learn the lesson at the end of book two. It is our choices, Harry, far more than our abilities to show what we truly are. Okay? Just to just kind of let that sit there. So then we get into Prisoner of Azkaban. Now, somebody in this book got sent to Azkaban, right? Mm -hmm. Hagrid. When? Wins. <laughs> Plural. Twice. Once at the age of 13 once at the age of 63, that is, in this book, he got sent to Azkaban, okay? So now we're prisoner of Azkaban. It gets introduced here. She's going to bring up more about Azkaban here. So, I'll post. Here he's reading the Daily Prophet and stuff. He's, you know, reading stuff for school, kind of. Um, he gets phone call from Ron he gets mail from his friends he sees in the Daily Prophet picture on the front page the Weasley family with the Great Pyramid or the Sphinx page 8 know if it actually says it doesn't say it just in Egypt on which page Page nine. oh there it is standing in front of a large pyramid and there's the entire Weasley clan all of them okay even Bill and um, Charlie. Charlie who were in their 20s by now okay early 20s probably and there's Ron front and center with a rodent sticking out of his uh, pocket, okay? So, Ron, you know, tells them some things, how they got there, blah, 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 blah. Percy's head boy, sends Harry a pocket sneakoscope, book four, okay? He gets a letter from Hermione. Um, she mentioned, again, Percy is head boy. He gets a package from Hagrid, page 14. For his birthday, thought you might find this useful for next year. It's a man-eating book, apparently, when Harry tries to open it. And then he gets his letter from Hogwarts, okay? Next chapter, Aunt Marge's big mistake. Who is Aunt Marge? Vernon's sister. Vernon's sister. Describe Aunt Marge. Large one. Okay. She also Okay. Kind of like Vernon in a dress. <laughs> I mean, she's pretty much Vernon in a dress. I mean, I, I think she's even described as having a little bit of a mustache growing. Okay. Why is it significant that she breeds not just dogs, but bulldogs? bulldogs? She does kind of bear a resemblance to him. Okay. Not much neck. Probably, probably a 
And what's her name again? Margaret. More than likely, she is based on Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> former Prime Minister, <laughs> former Prime Minister of Great Britain. Why? Margaret Thatcher, conservative. J.K. Rowling, very left. She's not just, you know, here's the center and here's J.K. J.K. Rowling, pretty far left. She, no love loss between J.K. Rowling and Margaret Thatcher. When J.K. Rowling starts writing these books, that is Margaret Thatcher's last year in office. She elected prime minister in 79, I believe, left office in 91. It's either 91 or 92, right? The British media often would depict Thatcher with Thatcher's face on the body of a bulldog because she was kind of looked at as the female Winston Churchill. And Churchill famously was portrayed his face on a bulldog, you know, because if you know anything about bulldogs, they don't back down. Got these big, massive chests, little tiny legs, okay? And once they plant, they're like pit bulls. They just, they don't give up. Churchill famously, you know, during the battle for Britain, we'll fight them on the beaches, we'll fight them in the hills, we'll fight them on the forest, we'll fight them from the rooftops. We shall never surrender, kind of a thing, okay? That was Thatcher too, for the most part. So, chapter begins. Harry's in the kitchen with the rest of the family. They've got the news on. And we see an image of this guy named Sirius Black, an escaped convict, all right? Page 17. No need to tell us he's no good, says Vernon. Look at the state of him, the filthy layabout. Look at his hair. Yes. Wait, so they have like wizard TV too? No, this is regular TV. Oh. <laughs> this is just regular TV. So why is he on like BBC4, the national news? I'm trying to make what the you, Don't worry about spoiling anything because we're going to finish this definitely on Thursday. Okay. We got today and well, basically, there's like some muggles that are connected and know more about the wizarding world. So they, um, and because he's such at this point, he's such a high-profile convict. They they and has also killed muggles in the past. Yeah. They release his information to Muggle media. That's the reason he killed thirteen muggles previously, years ago, and now he's escaped. Okay, so it'd be like a mass murderer escaping from prison. You can't only protect the magical world. So the minister of magic liaises with the prime minister. We find out in book six. Okay. So that when something really bad is happening in the magical world, the prime minister is notified, etc., etc. The opening chapter of that, excuse me, the second chapter of that book. I think it's the second chapter. So, they go on and talk about, you know, um, some other stuff. They don't, the, the news broadcast doesn't say where he was in prison. There's a, a prison just outside London. Can't remember what it's called. And it's like our San Quentin. I'm from California. San Quentin's the worst place you can go to. Before San Quentin, Alcatraz. Was the worst place you could go to. They sent people to Alcatraz to die, essentially. Okay, um, and I can't remember the name of the British prison, but that's what Azkaban essentially is for the Wizarding World. But they don't know where he was when he escaped. So this is just kind of a a bolo alert to be on the lookout for this guy anywhere in Britain. Okay. And then, bottom of 17, Harry finds out Aunt Marge is coming to visit. He's like, top of 18, she, she's not coming here, right? <laughs> She'll be here for a week, Vernon says. And while our, we're on the subject, we need to get a few things straight. That is, while she's here, you're going to keep it on the straight and narrow. 
What was one of the things Harry got from Hogwarts? Uh, permission slip to go to... Um, Hogsmeade permission slip that he has to get his guardians to sign. So, Harry pulls a Frodo and Gollum act. He's going to negotiate. And he's about as good a negotiator with Vernon as Frodo was with Gollum. Okay? Because he didn't get the specified master of the precious and everything. In that negotiation, Harry will be good for a week. In return, Vernon will sign his permission slip, right? Every negotiation involves two parties. What the two parties try to figure out in the act of negotiating is which of us has the upper hand? Which of us is in the position of power? Right? You go to buy a car in the process of, I hate buying cars, in the process of buying a, another car, used car. What do you try to do? You try to figure out what the other person will take. What's the lowest amount the person will take? While you're also trying to figure out, is it a piece of crap or not? Or not? You know? The other person is trying to figure out what? How much can I soak this person for? Can I make him, her pay the full asking price kind of a thing? Who's in the position of power in this negotiation? Vernon. Why? Because, well, one, he's Harry's guardian, so he holds all the power. Okay. He's a jerk. And well, with Aunt Marge coming, he, like, you know, he can look at Harry accidentally stepping on her foot as Harry being bad and, like, taking away his foot. So, like, Harry really has to be very, very, like, he can't even enter the room the wrong way. Like, okay. He has to be. Okay. That's all true. Does that put him in the position of power? No. What can Harry do? Magic reveal everything. Harry can do, he can spill his guts. He can tell Aunt Marge what? About Hogwarts. About Hogwarts. He could actually even, you know, accidentally do magic, right? Though that happened the previous year, and he got a letter threatening him with expulsion. And Harry didn't even do that magic. All right. What characterizes the Dursleys? And I think this, by extrapolation, characterizes Aunt Marge too. First paragraph, first book. Just about the last sentence of that first paragraph. They don't hold to anything strange or mysterious. Harry and his background are about as strange and mysterious as they come. <clears throat> See, notwithstanding everything you said, I think Harry's the one in the position of power here. He could really screw things up for not only Aunt Marge intellectually, but her relationship with her brother and everything. Okay? Okay but I don't think he realizes that. Probably, partially because of the letter he got the previous year. He's thinking, I can't do anything. So he agrees to Vernon's deal. Tell the line and I'll sign it, okay? So, she comes, a few days go by, And well, no. she comes first day, first morning, page 23. So, still here, are you? How old is Harry? 13. 13. Yes. Don't say yes in that ungrateful tone. It's damn good of Vernon and Petunia to keep you. What did she do? She, Marge, and Rowan. First time in the books, by the way. She swore. Damn good. Okay. Why didn't she use damn in the first book? Because they were younger. Nine, 10, 11 year olds reading it. 
piss off parents. And yet when we're going to get to book seven, she's going to have people say, I, something like, I effing don't care. And she writes out E-F-F-I-N-G. Rather than... <laughs> lose my letters okay so you'd have gone straight to an orphanage if you'd been dumped on my doorstep that should just reverberate never thought about it literally until now okay? because partly of what Tom Riddle said previous book and what we will find out in books 6 and 7 so Harry was bursting to say he'd rather live in an orphanage than with the Dursleys. Only problem is, does Harry know anything about orphanages? Not really, unless he's read, you know, Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, in which case he probably wouldn't think that. So, she asks Vernon, where is it you send him to school? St. Brutus's. What is St. Brutus's? St. Brutus's Secure Center for the Incurably Insane, for Incurably criminal. criminal Boys. And yet he gets to come home every day at four o'clock you know, or whatever in the afternoon. If he's incurably criminal, what do we tend to do with incurable criminals? Lock him up. And throw away the key, kind of a thing. Okay. And she asked, do they use the cane? Corporal punishment. All right? British terminology. What is meant by using the cane? This isn't like a little ruler. It's a round stick, like Dudley's smelting stick that's going to come up. Okay? And what do you do? You smack a kid over the butt or the back of the legs till it raises welts. Good corporal punishment, you know. <laughs> uh, Vernon nods. Harry, yeah. Feeling as he might do the thing properly all the time. Excellent. I won't have this namby pamby wish you. This is all, again, I think Thatcherism in Rowling's mind, okay? Wishy-washy nonsense about not hitting people who deserve it. A good thrashing is what's needed in 99 cases out of 100. Have you been beaten often? Oh, yeah, loads of times. Sounds a little too eager there, you know. Still don't like your tone, boy. If you think of, if you can speak of your beatings that casual way, they aren't hitting you hard enough. Petunia, call them up. Tell them, beat this kid, you know. Make it clear you approve the use of extreme force. Okay. So Vernon tries to change the subject. Heard the news? What's the news from this morning? The prisoner escaped. Mass killer escaped. Do you think that's going to make her feel better? <laughs> so, a few days go by. Third day, the reading lunch, page 25. Harry's sitting there. She's glaring at Harry. Aunt Marge is. Must have blamed yourself for the way the boys turned out, Vernon. If there's something rotten on the inside, there's nothing anyone can do about it. What does that sound like? She's insulting. Okay, what else though? What does it sound like that we've already read in a previous book? Possibly, I mean in this series. Rotten turned the core. Bad blood. Everyone knows a Malfoy's not worth it. Hagrid. Hagrid to the Weasleys and Harry about Lucius Malfoy. Right? If they're rotten on the inside, notice, you're not going to change them. What has to change? If they're rotten on the inside, the inside's got to change, right? Something in here has got to change. Okay. Harry tries to concentrate on his food, but his hand shook and his face is starting to burn with anger. So what happens to your face when you start to burn with anger? Especially if you're really pale, 
You turn red. He's getting ready to burst. And Aunt Marge is holding a wine glass. It's one of the basic rules of breeding. You see it all the time with dogs. If there's something wrong with the bitch, there'll be something wrong with the pup. And her wine glass bursts. Okay. How does Harry, assume for the moment, how does Harry interpret what she just said? Okay, keep going. Then there's something wrong with him? Yeah, keep going. That's just restating it. That's not <coughs> interpreting. What has she just called his mother? A bitch. A bitch. I mean, literally, she's correct. Female dog is a bitch, okay? And the wine glass breaks. Okay? Not too worry. He must have squeezed it too hard. Did the same thing at Colonel Flubster's the other day. Harry thinks he did it, right? He leaned against the wall. It had been a long time since he'd lost control and made something explode. Harry wasn't there the other day at Colonel Fubster's. When she broke a wine glass, anybody know anything about wine glass and kind of laws of physics? That glass in a goblet has what's called tinsel strength. It makes it very hard to do this. Like, extremely hard. Yeah. So the fact that, okay, she's done it before. I think that, I think we're being told, Harry didn't do this. She did it. Even though Harry thinks he did it. Okay? If she can do that with her hand, you don't want to get in a fight with Aunt Marge. She's a strong old bat. In other words, all right? What's another reason for assuming it wasn't Harry that did this? Bingo. There's no letter. The ministry knows, we find out later how, but the ministry knows when an underage magician or wizard or witch does magic, whether they're using a wand or not. Okay? So... Next three days are over. It's the last day. It's the last evening of the last day. Harry has just got to get through this night. So they're having their final meal. Aunt Petunia cooks a fancy dinner. And Uncle Vernon uncorks several bottles of wine. Now, I never thought of it this way before. So I'm going to give you two options for what does that mean? He uncorks several bottles of wine. Two options. One, he uncorks one bottle after another. That is, they drink one bottle, he opens another. They drink that bottle, he opens another. To find several. At least four. At least four, probably, because one is one. And if I had another one, then we'd have a couple. And then we'd have a few with maybe three or four, and then you get to several, right? So four or five or more. How many people are drinking wine at this dinner? Three. Vernon, Petunia, Marge. Maybe they're very understanding parents, and they let Dudley and Harry have a little glass each. I doubt it. Dudley, maybe, definitely not Harry. So, three adults. Describe Petunia's body type, size. She's skinny. She's skinny. She's not going to drink much wine. Because probably one, maybe two, that'll send her over. Vernon and Marge, they they're rotund. They can, they can put a bit down. How much is a bit? So let's assume Petunia has two glasses. Two glasses, about a fourth of a bottle. They've uncorked several. I'm assuming that's probably like five. I'm assuming also that four of those five were emptied. So if Petunia has a couple of glasses, 
That leaves like three and a half bottles between Vernon and, uh, Vernon and March. It, if you weigh 300 pounds and you drink two bottles of wine, you're going to be sloshed. I mean, it's going to have an effect. So, they finish the wine, and Vernon brings out a bottle of brandy. Brandy is stronger than wine. Why? Because brandy is distilled wine. So it gets even more pure. Can I tempt you, Marge? She had already had quite a lot of wine. Her huge face was very red. And she says, just a small one then. Bit more than that, bit more, that's the ticket. Why? Because he pours the brandy. So notice he pours and he starts to stop and she goes, a bit more, a bit more. <laughs> How do you drink brandy? Anybody know? You sip it. You don't put, you don't get one of these <laughs> and fill it with brandy. If this were a glass, you would put like maybe that much, okay? Unless it's I know, been some rough really good scotch, then you could go two fingers. <laughs> <laughs> if it's really good scotch, I'd go four fingers. <laughs> this is brandy after all the wine, right? Dudley's eating his fourth slice of pie. How do you usually slice pie? Fourths, eighths. He's just eaten half a pie. Okay? Petunia is sipping her coffee with her little finger out. Why? She has manners. She understands proper manners. Harry wants to leave. And Aunt Marge smacks her lips, puts the empty glass back down. No sipping for her. This is, okay. Excellent not Pecunia. So she smacks her lips and belches at the table. Petunias. What has Aunt Marge just done? Something rude. Something very rude. Now there are cultures where belching at the table is entirely appropriate. And to not belch after you eat is rude, okay? Not English Western culture. And she talks about Dudley being a healthy sized boy. What is it? Book four? I think it is. Where Dudley is described, or is it five? Where Dudley is described as a the size of a small killer whale. <laughs> You'll be a proper sized man, Dudders, like your father. <laughs> yes, I'll have a spot more brandy burning. <laughs> now this one here, and she jerks her head at Harry. This one's got a mean, runty look about him. You get that with dogs. I had Colonel Fubster drown one last year. Ready little thing it was, weak, underbred. Harry's trying to remember, page 12 of his book, A Charm to Cure Reluctant Reversers. It all comes down to blood, as I was saying the other day. Bad blood will out. That is, it will show itself. Because what happens often to runts of litters? They die on their own. Okay? She had Fubster kill one so that she didn't have to waste the time allowing the little runty one to try to get milk from its mother and just kill the thing so that the others have more can get big and strong. You know? I'm saying nothing against your family, Petunia, but your sister was a bad egg. They turn up in the best families. Then she ran off with a wastrel, and here's the result. Not here's the child, here's the offspring. It's here's the result like a bad science experiment. Harry hears a funny ringing in his ears. Why? I have ringing in my ears constantly. Right now, I've got my phone playing like ocean surf, because even when I'm talking, I hear the ringing constantly. 
That's not the kind of ringing Harry's hearing. Why is he hearing it? Because he's about to snap. Blood His boiling. blood is boiling. His blood pressure is boom, boom. His heart's not necessarily beating fast. It's just beating really hard. Okay? This potter, says Aunt Marge, loudly seizing the brandy bottle, splashing more into her glass and over the tablecloth. More than likely because there's two glasses there now. She's <laughs> trying to find the right one. He never told me what he did. Vernon and Petunia looking tense at each other. Dudley even looks up. Dudley's probably thinking, oh, yeah. Yo, I better back up. He didn't work. Unemployed, as I expected. A no account, good for nothing, lazy scrounger. Okay? Harry, he was not. Table went silent. Harry shaking all over. He had never felt so angry. Vernon, ever the astute one, always knowing the right thing to say at the right time. More brandy, Marge? <laughs> <laughs> What's the effect? You got an arsonist with a nice little fire going. You bring up a fire engine that doesn't have a tank full of water. It's got a tank full of gasoline. More? <laughs> he emptied the bottle. Okay, He had just opened the bottle, we were told. The bottle of brandy is, this is 20 fluid ounces. 1.25 liters of pints. A bottle of brandy is more than that. It's probably going to be 750 milliliters. If you buy scotch and whiskey, you know the size to get. That's a big bottle. <laughs> How is she not under the table? And then <laughs> drunk it all. <laughs> yeah. How is she not under the table? She's trying to get her to pass out drunk at some point. The true She's a big girl. <laughs> you boy, go to bed. She goes, no, Vernon. Oh. Holding up a hand, tiny bloodshot eyes. So we've already been told her face is very red. Her eyes are now bloodshot. She's three sheets to the wind. Okay? I don't know where that phrase came from, but she's probably more like six sheets to the wind. Okay? They go and get themselves killed in a car crash. Drunk, I expect. Why does she expect drunk? Because she's drunk now? No, because she thinks very lowly of them. Harry, they didn't die in a car crash. Now, notice, Harry now knows the truth, right? He found out in book one. They died in a car crash, you nasty little liar, left you to be a burden on their decent, hard-working relatives. You're an insolent, ungrateful, and then she starts to blow up, Okay. Harry threatens Vernon with what before he leaves? You want? I'm leaving. She deserved it. I'm going. I've had enough. The night bus. So Harry gets his trunk and leaves. Doesn't have any money. <laughs> Doesn't know where he's going. Okay. It's not like he can catch a bus, go to London, because they don't live in London. Get a bus that'll take him to platform nine and three quarters because he doesn't have a ticket for the Hogsmeade Express and the Hogsmeade Express won't be there yet. It only shows up when? September 1st, okay? So he's got his trunk, he's now several blocks away and he trips off the curb, lands in the street, but when he trips, he throws out his arm to break his fall. And the night bus appears. How do you call the night bus? You put out your wand arm. It used to blow my students' minds. The first time we would do something, when I when I do a Harry Potter course in London, and we'd be getting ready to do our first kind of field trip, and or actually, I'd be leading them on a walking tour around the general location where we were the first day there. So we'd get there, they threw all their stuff somewhere, and I. And we'd had scheduled walking tours. And I'd lead them on a walking tour and I'd say, okay, pull out your passes. We're going to take a bus and go, you know, either down the road or up the road a mile or something. And I'd say, anybody know how to call the bus? Because sometimes there are regular assigned bus stops 
And other times there are stops where the bus will only stop if somebody is there in signaling for a stop. And I'd say, put out your wand arm. And they'd go, what? That's all it is. And the bus stops. And I'm, these were uber Harry Potter nerds. Okay? And their minds are just, like, I can't believe it. she actually brought that in the book. Anyways, so Harry gets on the night bus. Who does he meet? The two people working on the bus are the ones I want to talk about. Ernie. Ernie Prang. Stan. And Stan Shunpike. Stan's going to get important later, more important at least. Ernie's going to get dropped off. We're not going to hear much about Ernie Prang anymore. But Harry, as he's on the bus, he gives them a different name. Who's? Neville's. Neville's. <laughs> and that is, well, okay, it's poor Neville, but that's also rolling, wanting us to kind of keep Harry and Neville together. Somebody came up after the end of class the other day and asked me a question about Neville in relation to Harry pulling Dr. Gryffindor's sword out of the hat at the end of book two, don't say anything because we're going to see something similar to that happen in a later book. So, where does the night bus take him? Where does Harry get dropped off? The leaky cauldron. The leaky cauldron. But while there, he gets more information about Sirius Black. He looks over a woman's shoulder and reads the newspaper. Pages... 36 and 37. Okay. And he reads this stuff about Black, how he committed a massacre 12 years ago. Let's see, 12 years ago. How old would Harry have been 12 years ago? What else happened 12 years ago? His parents died. And Voldemort went poof. Does Harry make any kind of connection? No. No, because no, Harry's not that bright. Okay. <laughs> Hermione would make the connection very easily. So, they drop Harry off in page 43. Who is there to meet him? Fudge. Fudge. Hold on, let me back up. Make sure I have the right spot. I would have sworn it was a different page. Um, Fudge introduces himself, page 43, which Harry already knows who he is because he spied on him under the invisibility cloak, right? Previous book. So Fudge says, You've had us all in the right flap, running away from your aunt and uncle's house like that, but you're safe, and that's all that matters. Okay? He said, don't worry about Miss Marjorie Dursley. Notice her name isn't Margaret. I don't think Rowling wanted it to be, if I'm right. I don't think Rowling wanted it to be too close an association. Um, he says, she's been punctured. Her I love that line, she's been punctured. And her memory has been modified. She has no recollection of the incident, so that's that, and no harm done. He says, um, your aunt and uncle, they'll take you back as long as you stay at Christmas. Uh, stay at Hogwarts for Christmas and Easter holidays. So you get to go back next summer. Notice, Marge's memory has been modified, but he doesn't say anything about Vernon and Petunias. Hmm. Harry, I always stay, and I don't want to go back. I'm sure you're fond of each other, etc. So, he says, now we have to decide, what are you going to do for the next two weeks, Harry? Where are you going to spend that time? Harry's thinking something else. What? How am I going to be punished? He was threatened with expulsion last year for something he didn't do. 
He had nothing, absolutely nothing to do with Dobby dropping the pudding. I broke the law, page 45. The decree for the restriction of underage wizardry. Oh, my dear boy, we're not going to punish you for a little thing like that. Harry's like, last year I got a warning. I got a warning because a house elf smashed a pudding. It said I'd be expelled. <clears throat> Circumstances change, Harry. We have to take into account, in the present climate, you don't want to be expelled. No. Well, okay, done then. What does Harry think about the law? Black and white. Black and white. You break it or you don't break it. You break it, you suffer the consequences. What is Fudge suggesting about the law? It's great. Flexible, bendable. Flexible, bendable. Listen to the adjective I'm going to, or adverb I'm going to use. It's fudgeable. I think it's why she names him fudge. You ever heard the verb to fudge something? Yeah. What do you do? Kind of screw it together. Yeah, you make it work. All right? You bend it, you mold it to your need. Fudge is suggesting. I can massage the law so that nothing happens to you. Which is going to be a real problem. One of the, one of the things Rowling, I think, is bringing up here, and she brings it up in, in other novels, is the question of the application of the law. The equal application of the law. You know, we have in the Constitution, 14th Amendment, the Due Process Clause. Which means, how it's usually ruled, everybody has to be treated equally, okay, in terms of their due process according to legal requirements, the laws, et cetera, et cetera. Harry doesn't understand that yet, okay? So, they go into the leaky cauldron, and Harry essentially gets what? A room for two weeks. So he can pop in and out of Diagon Alley. He gets free ice cream, you know, every day. He gets to go lust over the Fireball 2000, you know, broom, etc. So, the Weasleys show up. Um, Hermione shows up. And I'm going to skip a bunch. Pages 6. No, hold on. 64 and 65. Harry overhears Mr. and Mrs. Weasley. In other words, he's doing what? Not intentionally. He's eavesdropping. How often in the books, let's just say up to this point, do we see somebody eavesdropping, whether intentional or not? Oh, more than that. Yeah. It happens a lot. It happens a lot. We saw it a little bit in Lord of the Rings, right? Second chapter, who eavesdrops on Gandalf and Frodo? Sam. What's the result? Sam ends up at Mount Doom thinking he's going to die, you know. I mean, there's a lot of instances of eavesdropping leading up to this point. And then there's going to be a lot more, okay? Why do you think Rowling does that? Or, let me rephrase that. Up to this point, what are often the effects or the results of the eavesdropping? Okay. That's what he learns. What happens on the basis of what he learns? Is it always positive? No. no. In fact, I think you can go through and look at them. Most often... Yes. Where I have decisions afterwards. Yeah. Why? Bingo! She doesn't have all the information. 
He's overheard what? Part of it. Or somebody else has overheard part of it. Okay? That's going to get built. That idea of hearing part of a conversation is really going to reach its apex, we find out, in book seven. And yet we're going to see, when we see that scene in book seven, it is what creates the central conflict of all seven books. What's the central conflict? What does Voldemort want to do? Kill Harry Potter. We don't know why until we get to book seven. We partially know why book five. End of book five. Don't, don't say anything else. But we really don't know fully, kind of, until we get to book seven. I mean, we get most of it in book five, but it, the full import doesn't get revealed until book five. So Harry overhears this conversation, okay? And what's it about? Him. Him, partially. And Sirius Black. Sirius Black. And what does he hear? That Arthur wants to tell... Yeah, yeah, not that part. What does he hear about Sirius Black? He's the one who told Voldemort that Sirius Black. Um... No, I don't think that's here. He's escaped, which Harry already knows. And what's he want to do? Kill Harry. He wants to go after Harry. Okay. What's the problem with overhearing this conversation? It's wrong. They're wrong. What is the ministry basing its ideas upon? The last time, Sirius Black didn't go after Harry the last time. Double, uh, Voldemort did. It's based upon possibly rumors, and we'll find out later, at least partially, on Fudge's last interaction with Sirius Black. Which we will also come to find out. How much of that interaction did Fudge actually understand? 1%. He was totally wrong about what was happening in that interaction. So, Arthur wants to tell Harry, Petunia, uh, Petunia, Molly says, Mrs. Weasley says, you can't. It'll frighten him. What have we seen Harry do, book one, book two? Go after stuff. Go after stuff. What else? He defeated Lord Voldemort twice. He defeated him once in his, I don't know what you call him, parasite head on the back of a head form, <laughs> and in the other in his ghostly 16-year-old form. Okay? So, chapter, uh, next chapter, The Dementor. Mr. Weasley keeps close to Harry, and just before they get on the train... Mr. Weasley pulls Harry aside. He says, I know what, I know what you're going to tell me about. Sorry, I overheard your conversation with Mrs. Weasley. Uh, I already know, page 72, 73. I'll be a good boy. Stay in the castle. That's what you want to hear. Mr. Weasley, not entirely. Swear to me, you won't go looking for black. What? Promise that whatever happens, why would I go looking for someone who wants to kill me? Just swear to me. That whatever you might, and I never, literally, never focused on this before. I don't know why. Whatever you hear, he doesn't finish his sentence. Why not? When is that sentence going to get finished? Not necessarily by Arthur Weasel. In about. It's in the Marauders Map chapter. Okay. He finds out. Yep. Information. So Harry gets on the train with Ron, Hermione, Ginny, Neville. They find a carriage. The carriage is occupied by somebody. 
page 74, a Professor R.J. Lupin, okay, and Hermione tells Harry, 75, don't go looking for trouble. Harry's like, I don't go looking for trouble. It just seems to find me. Book one. <laughs> Did trouble just find him? Did Harry just fall through the trap door? No, he went looking for it. Uh, book two. Did Harry just fall into the Chamber of Secrets magically? No, he went looking for it. Okay. So you kind of know something's going to happen. So they talk about Hogsmeade and such. And Harry's really wishing he could go. Okay. Crab and Goyle and Malfoy come in. And start to, you know, things get a little tense. And Hermione goes kind of like, shh. And they draws their attention. Malfoy, who's this? He's a professor. Malfoy is smart enough to know to back off and not, okay. Um, Eighty-two, eighty-three. Bottom of eighty-one, eighty-two, and eighty-three. Train slows down, and all the lights go out. Notice the, these aren't electric lights; they're some other kind of lights. But it gets pitch black. <clears throat> Everybody sits down, and we hear a voice say, "Quiet." Bottom 82, Lupin must have gotten up. He tells him, stay where you are. He holds a handful of flames, goes to the door, door slides open, okay? But before Lupin can reach it, that's when the door slides open, and in comes this big creature. Look at the description, and I'm gonna ask a question, but the question's gonna be dependent upon you're being familiar with either another work of literature or a film or a version of a film. It's a popular story. The version, film version of the story comes out every year, beginning in about a month or so, okay? And will be on TV and such and a lot of different channels. Standing in the doorway, illuminated by the shivering flames and Lupin's hand, was a cloaked figure towered to the ceiling. Its face was completely hidden beneath its hood. Harry's eyes, so it's got a hood, covers its face. Harry's eyes darted downward, and what he saw made his stomach contract. There was a hand protruding from the cloak, and it was glistening grayish, slimy looking, and scabbed, like something dead that had decayed in water. Ring any bells. Charles Dickens. Um, um. Yeah, oh, that. Yeah, yeah that. <laughs> A Christmas Carol. Not the ghost of Christmas past, because that's Santa Claus, <laughs> Father Christmas. Not the ghost of Christmas present. The ghost of Christmas future. Has a, has a cowl over his face so you can't see it. He comes carrying, in most depictions, a big long pole. And what's on the end of the pole? A sign. What is he? Death. Death. Okay. And the hands often are depicted exactly this way. I mean, like scab and bits of flesh peeling off, like it's been some, like what you would see in the dead passages. The dead coming up. Okay. But it was visible only for a split second as though the creature beneath the cloak since Harry's gaze, the hand was suddenly withdrawn. Then the thing behind the hood, whatever it was, drew a long, slow, rattling breath. What is that? In literature, in myth, often when somebody dies, just before the crook, they go, it's called the death rattle. My daughter's an ICU nurse. She's seen a lot of people die. She told me, I don't remember what it was, during the height of COVID. She said, Dad, the death rattle's real, man. Because she's heard it, kind of a thing. Okay? 
An intense cold swept over them all. Harry feels his own breath catch in his chest. Cold goes deeper than his skin. It was inside his chest, inside his heart. And his eyes roll up. And he falls off the chair, the seat. Okay? He hears a screaming, terrified, terrified, pleading screams. And then someone slaps him across the face and wakes him up. You okay? Ron asks, yeah. What happened? Who screamed? Ron, no one screamed. Ginny and Neville are looking back at him, pale. Hermione's wondering, okay. And Lupin gives him a piece of chocolate. What was that thing? A Dementor, one of the Dementors of Azkaban. He tells Harry, eat, it'll help, okay? Ron, I thought you were having a fit or something. Now, Neville says, page 85, it was horrible, okay? We find out Ginny was cowering in the, you know, corner, shaking like mad, et cetera, et cetera. And then on page 87, Malfoy runs in. So what happens between 85 when Neville says, it was horrible, you feel how cold it got, and Malfoy comes in? What did Neville do? Left the compartment, and apparently went up and down the train, knocking on doors and going, Harry Potter fainted at a Dementor. Harry Potter fainted at a Dementor. Why? Why the hell would Neville do that? Did Ron faint? Did Jenny faint? Did Hermione faint? Did Neville faint? No, he didn't. And I think that's why. I think the clown or like the tall guy. Possibly. Or the one who didn't faint. Harry Potter fainted. I didn't. What's Neville just kind of done for himself? Let me put it that way. He's elevated himself. How often has Neville been elevated? Books one through this point. Well, Dumbledore gave him 10 points. Woo, you know, <laughs> participation trophy, folks. That's what it was. Book two? No. What is Neville going to do in one, in about three or four chapters? He's going to do something really, really, really stupid. Okay. So this is kind of Neville making himself feel better. It's the only reason I can think of. So let's back up for a minute. So Malfoy, well, take the back. Malfoy comes in. Malfoy belittles Harry and such. And they get to the school. McGonagall takes Harry to Madame Pomfrey. Why? Because he fainted. Harry, she says, you know, delicate students shouldn't have dementors around. Harry's like, I'm not delicate. How do we know Harry isn't delicate? Book one, book two, yeah. Okay. Um, what does Madame Pomfrey say he needs? Chocolate, again. What's with the chocolate all of a sudden? It makes you feel happy. J.K. Rowling said that when she was writing this book and she came up with the idea of the Dementor, the Dementors are physical manifestations of depression. Not just, oh, I got a bad grade on that exam. I'm bummed out today. I mean, near suicidal depression, where you don't see any hope, any light in the future. That kind of depression. She fought it in her 20s after her mother died. Her mom was only like 41, 42 when she died of cancer. Okay. That, by the way, is, I think, one of the things rolling is partially wrestling with in these books. The death of parents. We're going to see a key scene where Harry is going to be thinking of people dying, just, you know, like falling like leaves around him, all right? So, how in the world do you use chocolate to fight off depression? Well, let's back up a little bit. Dementor. What's the root of that word? 
It's got a prefix and a suffix. Prefix D or suffix meaning male agent who, the male agent of this verb, meant comes from men's meaning mind. All right? So a mentor, you may not have mentors, but every one of you has an advisor as part of your major. What does your advisor do? Tell you how to like Help you get through college, what classes to take, when to sign certain forms, when to file those forms. You know, if, for example, in your graduating semester, you forget to file it's a candidacy or you take a graduate form, you won't graduate. If you forget to sign a stupid form, really ridiculous. Okay? I had one student once who couldn't graduate because he, or it might have been one of my kids. <laughs> Yeah. One of the two <laughs> was missing one PE credit. Like, needed to take golf. One freaking credit. Okay? Anyways, so a mentor is one who advises, guides, supports, directs, advises. A D mentor, therefore, is the opposite of that. So, not someone who helps you, someone who harms you, someone who holds you back. Someone who de-minds you, like ruins your mind, takes away your mind. For some of you, it's probably this class. You know? <laughs> so what is that? What is depression? Real depression. It's not feeling blue. It's not feeling sad. The inability of happiness. Inability of happiness, partially. It's kind of... Oh, sorry, just like total absence of emotion. It's kind of where you can't think straight. You don't see things properly. Because what, what do you only see? Negative. The negatives. You only see the bad. You don't see any of the good. All right? Lupin's going to talk to Harry about that in a few pages. And he's going to say what the Dementor does is it sucks all joy and happiness, all good thoughts, all good feelings, all good memories out of you. So what are you left with? Sadness. You're left with all the darkness. You know, cue the Simon and Garfunkel song. Hello, darkness, my old friend. It's nice to talk to you again. Okay? So, what does chocolate have to do with that? Chocolate releases in the body. I don't think it's serotonin. It it's dopamine. Dopamine is a chemical. It's a hormone, actually, that it makes you feel good. I used to run, train for marathons, half marathons, and stuff. One of those crazy people, I'd get out there, they had about 12, 15, 16 miles, and the dopamine would release. And I'd just get into this groove, and I could just keep on running. I think the longest run, other than a marathon I did, was like, 28 miles because I'd hit that and just your the dopamine kind of takes over. Chocolate, and I love J.K. Rowling because of this, chocolate does the same thing, okay? It releases that drug, essentially. And it, she talked in an interview about it helped her partially through depression. So, go from there to, they get to school, Beginning of the year feast, what does Dumbledore warn them of? There's Dementors all the way around the school property, school grounds. Don't go in the Forbidden Forest. Don't go in any secret passageways. He talks about all the entrances and exits are guarded. And who does he look at when he says that? Harry. Nope. Harry doesn't know about secret entrances in Fred and George. He does. Okay? Talons and tea leaves. Who do we get introduced to? New character. Haven't seen her before. Pansy. Who? Pansy, Pansy Parkinson? Mm -hmm. True. Okay. Who else? Teacher. No. Sybil Trelawney. Okay. Now we didn't talk about this. What was one of the new school books Harry had to get this year? Because he has a new class. New class, divination. 
The book is written by Cassandra Vablotsky. All right? That's the name used in the book. In the early 20th century, there was a real, meaning in our world, medium slash occultist slash fortune teller slash seer whose name was, uh, I can't remember her exact name, she was called Madame Blavatsky. Vablotsky Blavatsky. It's not an accident that Rowling takes the author of this book and bases it upon this person, okay? Sybil Trelawney. Trelawney's just a, a, kind of an old British name. A lot of people have that. They usually tend to be upper middle to upper class. Old, ancient, kind of, you know, almost pure blood notion, right? But her first name, where's Sybil come from? Not the lady with the 28 personalities uh, thing, case in the 1970s. Ancient Greece and Rome, the Sybils were prophetesses, seers. Okay. <coughs> so she's named Sybil Trelawney. What do we learn about her? First class, what does she do? They're reading tea leaves, and one of the kids sees what? She looks at it and says, oh, it's the Grim. What's a Grim? It's, okay, Harbinger of Death. And she predicts somebody's going to die. All right? What branch of magic does she teach? How much time do we have? 14 minutes. 15. 30. Divination. Look at all the classes Harry's taken or that Hermione will take. Because in just a moment, they'll start looking at their, their course schedules. And Ron's like, Hermione, you've got three different classes all at 9 o'clock. She has arithmancy, muggle studies, and divination, I think, all at the same time. You're good, but you're not that good. Okay. So first years take potions, herbology, transfiguration, charms, and defense against the dark arts. I don't remember if they take history and magic the first year or not. I don't think they do. I think that starts in the second year. Okay? I think it is. I think I'm right? I could be wrong. Hermione is now taking third year, in addition to these, arithmancy, Marvel studies, and care of magical creatures. Well, they're all taking care of magical creatures. Okay? So those apparently don't start, some of them, until your third year. But they're still taking these. In other words, you don't drop one and add on you just add on until they get to their sixth year when they get to their sixth year end of their fifth year they'll find out they won't be able to take some of these anymore all depends on how they do on their owl exams if they don't pass with a sufficient grade according to that professor one of these classes they get kicked out of it they don't want to take that anymore right so which of all of these kinds of magic, let's say, have a real world component? Real world. Can you study muggles in our world? No. Can you study potions in our potions in our world? No. Herbology? No. Transfiguration? No. Charms? No. Defense against the dark arts? No. Arithmancy? No. Muggle studies? No. Care of magical creatures? No. You can be a vet. <laughs> you can become a mathematician. You can be a horticulturist. You can be a chemist. Of all of these, this one you can. There's a place in Murfreesboro, I forget, it used to be over on Memorial, where you can go and get your palm read. You can get your fortune told. You can have a crystal ball consulted. You can have tea leaves read. You can go to Nashville, find probably 15 or 20 places that will do that. You can't go for any of these other things in anywhere, but you can go to any major city in the United States or Europe or England for this purpose. Why? 
In other words, why does she include this branch of real world quote unquote magic and not any other, so to speak? And possibly because there aren't any others. Why else though? It fits the story, okay. What are we going to be told, jumping to the end of this novel, about divination? And we don't even have to get to the end. Just get to the next chapter after when Harry's talking with McGonagall. What's McGonagall say about divination? That's what it is. It's a bunch of nonsense. She doesn't literally say that. What does she say? Sybil Trelawney has been predicting the death of a student every year since she arrived. How many have died? Goose egg. So how good are her predictions? Well, Dumbledore is going to say at the end of book, this book, uh, take that back, into book five, Dumbledore is going to say she's made an accurate prediction. That raises the total to two. I guess I'll have to give her a raise. <laughs> By the end of book five, she's made two accurate predictions. Okay? Hmm. He's even going to say it's either the end of this book or the end of book five. He's going to say no, it's later on. It's book five. He thought of getting rid of divination entirely as a subject. But if he did, I can't say too much. He would have to get rid of Trelawney. And he wants to keep her there <laughs> for one reason. The first one that she predicted, oh, it was a doozy. That is the first real prediction. Okay? Won't say anything about it. Um, well, that's why, he, I mean, he, which prediction? You mean the prediction about the death of a student yeah. in this book? She's done it every year since she's been there. Oh, God. I'm not catching what you're saying. I Ask me after class. <laughs> because in terms of, because in terms of this book, and she's predicting the death of a student at school this year. No. That's not accurate. There's no, no student dies this year. Now, between book four and book seven. <laughs> that's what they're saying. I mean, it could just kind of ball them all up. And well, <laughs> there's, you know, that's something else. That's something different. Okay? Just that they will die, not saying when. <laughs> no, she does say, and McGonagall says. Oh, she said it this year? McGonagall says, hold on. She predicts them death. I see, page 109. You should know, Potter, Sybil Trelawney has predicted the death of one student a year since she arrived at this school. None of them has died yet. Yeah, I, I, know, what you, I know what you mean now. That's a very, how, do, how should I put this? Liberal, not politically wise, liberal, generous, and charitable understanding of the prediction. I think McGonagall maybe is not as liberal, generous, and charitable as you are. Um, as we will see, which year? Christmas. Oh, which book? In one of the books. I can't remember which one. I don't think it's this one. Might be book five. Okay, so they go to Hagrid's class. Hagrid's now teaching, which is odd slash dangerous in and of itself. Um, he wonders why no one has read their book on magical creatures. Why is that? Because they don't know how to open it because it will eat you. <laughs> now think about that. Hagrid's book is physically dangerous. Is Rowling suggesting that books can be dangerous? Notice, books can be false. 
can books also be dangerous? Anyways, Talons and Teeley's finishes. Um, what's the Talons part of the chapter title? Buckbeak. Buckbeak, which is what? A hippogriff. A hippogriff, which is what? Yeah, what kind? Eagle, eagle and horse. Head and what? Front legs of an eagle? Boy, that's a weird image. And the body and back legs of a horse. Wings. Right with wings. With wings. Yeah, I know. Look right here, but I hate Mary Grunfrey's illustrations. Yeah, with wings. Okay? I mean, I <laughs> so, why does Buckbeak attack Malfoy but not Harry? Because Harry bowed down to Buckbeat and showed respect. Malfoy did not show respect. Harry showed respect. We're told hippogriffs are proud creatures. But, in fact, Malfoy did what? He just, he just ran up with his. Like, Malfoy says... My father would be about this. Page 118. <laughs> I knew it must... Oh, this is very easy. I knew it must have been if Potter could do it. I bet you're not dangerous at all, are you? Are you? You great, ugly brute. Okay. Gets attacked, runs off to daddy, you know. <laughs> castle gets fixed and such. Boggart in the wardrobe. Um, before Lupin's class, they have potions. Okay. How does Snape treat Neville? It's not any different from any other time. <laughs> Horribly. He picks on Neville. Why? Because Neville can't do this. Neville would do that like this. Okay? So Snake picks on him. He belittles him. He tears him down. We get the Boggart in the wardrobe. Defense against the dark arts. And what does Lupin do? Explains what a Boggart is. R Rowling doesn't invent Boggarts, by the way. They're part of Scottish mythology. Shape-shifting things. Find them in old castles and things like that, supposedly. Okay? So he says, a Boggart's going to take the shape of whatever thing you fear the most. So he has two questions. What's a Boggart? Hermione says it's a shapeshifter. Okay? And then he says it's going to take the shape of the thing you fear the most. And he asked Harry, how will that benefit us? And Harry's like, two, four, six, eight, you know. Well, there's like 30 people in here. Uh, it's not going to go which shape to take. Because we don't all fear the same thing. He goes, very good. Okay. So then he asked Neville, what do you fear the most? <laughs> Just had him, right? Snake. He goes, okay. People snicker. You live with the grandmother, right? Total non sequitur. Has nothing to do with Snape. He's like, yeah, but I don't want to see her pop out of that thing either. He goes, no, 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 you misunderstand me. How does she dress? Neville still is not getting it, but he describes. And notice his description. He can see his grandmother, like, right here. Whole nine yards. So, here's what I want you to do, Neville. When the, when the barber comes out, it's going to take the form of Professor Shane, Snape. I want you to put your mother's clothing onto Snape. Snape then becomes what? Like don't, don't be afraid to use an offensive term. A cross-dresser. Trans, in one sense. And I never thought of it until my class this morning. I thought... Oh, there's another reason the trans activists just hate J.K. Rowling with passion. By the way, Hagrid died the other day. Yeah, yeah. Day. And a lot of people danced on his grave, metaphorically. Just cheered that Robbie Coltrane was no longer with us. Why? Because he supported J.K. Rowling with everything she had to say about trans activists. Anyways, so put Snape in your grandmother's clothing. <laughs> comes out and the class just erupts in laughter. You think Snape hears about this? Yeah. How do you know? Wasn't he at the door and didn't want to show it? No, he already left. 
He'd been in the classroom, Snake tell, er, in the staff room. Snake tells him there's a bargain. He goes, yep, and I know it's going to be a practical lesson. The very next Defense Against the Dark Arts class, where's Lupin? He's ill. And what does Snape assign to him? <coughs> they have to read about werewolves, and they have to write, what is it, a three and a half foot long essay? Okay? Yeah. Snape, Snape knows. Okay? Why did you write, have them write that essay, by the way? Get to the end. Remus John Lupin. Remus Lupin. What are the names? Remus, brother Romulus, one of the two co-founders of Rome, who were raised by a wolf, a she-wolf. Okay? Lupin, lupus, L-U-P-U-S, is a disease related to wolves. It's thought. It isn't really. It's an autoimmune disease. But it was thought to be related. So you have wolf son, wolf, wolf son of wolf kind of thing is his name, right? So everybody else gets a shot at the boggart, except for Harry and Hermione. Harry and Ron kind of wonder what Hermione would have seen, and they joke, you know, a failing report card, you know, bad grade. Harry wonders what he would see, and his first reaction is Voldemort. He's going to later ask Lupin why he didn't let him do it, and Lupin says what? I was afraid Voldemort would come out and it wouldn't be good to have Voldemort show up in the castle. And Harry tells him, oh, I wasn't, no, it wouldn't have been Voldemort. Would have been what? Dementors, okay? And Lupin tells him, wow, Harry, that's amazing. Because what does that show? It shows that Harry is channeling his inner FDR. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, famously in a fireside chat of 1933, midst of the Great Depression, said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. He tells Harry, that's what you fear, is fear. We can deal with that. Okay, we will stop there. Um, believe it or not, we will finish this on Thursday because we're now a day behind.